grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Let us pray. Mighty God, you breathe life into our bones, and your Spirit brings truth to the world. Send us the Spirit, transform us by your truth, and give us language to proclaim your gospel. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Our scripture reading for the day comes to us from the book of Acts, the second chapter. When the day of Pentecost had come, the apostles were all together in one place, and suddenly from heaven there came a sound like the rush of a violent wind, and it filled the entire house where they were sitting. Divided tongues as a fire appeared among them, and a tongue rested on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other languages as the Spirit gave them ability. Now, there were devout Jews from every nation under heaven living in Jerusalem, and at this sound the crowd gathered and was bewildered, because each one heard them speaking in the native language of the other. Amazed and astonished, they asked, Are not all these who are speaking Galileans? And how is it that we hear each of us in our own native language? Parthians, Medes. Elamites and residents of Mesopotamia, Judea and Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia, Egypt and parts of Libya belonging to Cyrene and visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes, Cretans and Arabs. In our own languages, we hear them speaking about God's deeds of power. All were amazed and perplexed, saying to one another, What does this mean? But others sneered and said, they are filled with new wine. But Peter, standing with the eleven, raised his voice and addressed them. Men of Judah and all who live in Jerusalem, let this be known to you and listen to what I say. Indeed, these are not drunk, as you suppose, for it's only nine o'clock in the morning. No, this is what was spoken through the prophet Joel. In the last days it will be, God declares, that I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams, even upon my slaves, both men and women. In those days I will pour out my spirit, and they shall prophesy, and I will show portents in the heaven above, and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and smoky mist. The sun shall be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the coming of the Lord's great and glorious day. Then everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Here ends our scripture reading. Grace, mercy, and peace be to you from God our Father and our Lord and Savior Jesus the Christ. Maybe you heard about the woman who called the fire to Hurry, she said, come as quickly as you can. My house on fire. She hung up the phone. So a few minutes later, she called back and said, hurry, come as fast as you can. The fire spread from the kitchen to the dining room. She hung up again. A few minutes later, she called a third time, and this time the volunteer crew was ready to roll. And the dispatcher said, now calm down, ma'am. Tell us, how do we get there? And you can tell by her response that she was a bit confused. She said, oh, well, don't you still have that little red fire engine of yours? We can't get much of anywhere without directions, can we? This Sunday is Pentecost Sunday. On this day, we celebrate the outpouring of God's Holy Spirit upon the disciples, a day many mark as the birthday of the church. On this day, God sends God's Holy Spirit to the people of God to empower the people of God to do the work of God in the world. And that means that no one ever again has to live the faith, walk the walk, or do the work of God without direction and guidance ever again. One day a little girl went to visit her grandmother. It was a beautiful spring day and they decided to take a walk out to grandma's flower garden. And as Grandma was assessing the progress of her flowers, the little girl decided to take a rosebud and to open it with her own two hands. 
but no luck. Each time she tried to open a petal, it would bruise or it would tear or it would wilt or just simply fall apart. Finally, in frustration, she said, Grandma, I don't understand. When God opens a flower, it's beautiful. But when I try to do it, it falls apart. Well, honey, her grandmother said, you see, you have to understand. The reason God is able to do it is because God works from the inside out. God works from the inside out. Isn't that really the main message of Pentecost? Isn't that what the disciples discovered on that Pentecost day? Jesus had told the disciples to remain in Jerusalem, that he was going to ascend, but to wait for the Holy Spirit to come. And on Pentecost, the Holy Spirit came in a mighty and moving way. And this is where the story of Pentecost sort of picks up. The disciples are in the upper room, waiting, watching, some, no doubt, grumbling impatiently and nervously. What in the world are we doing here? All this waiting is making me want to climb the walls. It's no use anyway. Jesus is gone. Without him, we're nothing. It's over. We might as well face it. And what's all this talk about the Holy Spirit? Maybe they misunderstood. And just then, just then they heard sound. And the breath of God roared like a mighty wind into that place. And images of fire danced around the disciples. And suddenly, the disciples were no longer fearful. They had a sense of peace. They found courage, confidence, strength, and unity to go out and to proclaim the good news boldly and amazingly. And people from all different walks of life and backgrounds heard and responded and we're told over 3,000 people joined the church that day. It's interesting to note that the three classic symbols of the Holy Spirit found in the scriptures remind us of how God works through us and how God works from the inside out. Those symbols I'm talking about are breath, fire, and the descending dove. Let's look at each one of them for a few minutes. First, there was breath, the symbol of life and vitality. Maybe you remember how God, in the Garden of Eden, created Adam and Eve. God shaped them, but they were lifeless until God breathed into their nostrils the breath of life. They were not alive until God breathed into them the Spirit of God. And so it was at Pentecost. The Spirit of God, the breath of God, came like a mighty wind into that place, and suddenly the disciples came alive. The NBA playoffs are taking place, and after one game, the coach of the losing team was being interviewed, and he clearly was not happy with how his team had played. We deserve to get beat. We were absolutely listless out there tonight, he said. We had no drive, no emotion. It was like we were zombies just walking through the motions. We had no life. And then he added, we had no spirit. And in saying that, I was reminded that that seems to be a way a lot of people live life. They're spiritually listless. No zeal. No commitment. No drive. They're like robots simply existing, but really not alive. It's almost as if they've cut themselves off from God's Spirit in their lives. But God's Spirit is what takes us from simply existing, lifeless, to becoming the living, vibrant, loving beings God created us to be. The first symbol of Pentecost, the Holy Spirit, is breath. 
symbol of vibrancy and zeal and life. Indeed, it's the kind of life that can only come from the presence of God. Now, the second symbol is fire, a symbol of power. In the scriptures, fire often symbolizes God's presence and power. For example, we see that in the book of Exodus with the burning bush, and we also see it here in Acts with the story of Pentecost. One day there was a man who was suffering from a severe headache for several days on end. Finally, he decided to go to a doctor. He was greeted by the office nurse who looked and acted like she was a Marine sergeant, a drill sergeant from Harris Island. And when he told her about his chronic headache, she said, I want you to go into the examination room, take off your clothes, put this gown on, and the doctor will be in in a few minutes. But ma'am, the guy began to protest. Is all that really necessary? I mean, I don't think I need to do that. I'm just here talking to the doctor about a headache. Sir, she said, you heard what I said. Go into that examination and put on that gown. Well, he did what he was told. He went into the examination room and he went in, closed the door, turned around. He saw another man already sitting there in a hospital gown. The man with the headache says to the other guy, man, I don't even know what I'm doing here. This is crazy. All I came in to do was talk to the doctor about a headache. You think you got a problem, the other guy said. I just came in to read the meeting. Now that nurse had power, didn't she? But that's not the kind of power I'm talking about. Not brute force or blatant intimidation or power that comes from political clout or wealth or or assortment of other things like weapons. No, I'm talking about the power that comes from the presence of God in our lives. That presence produces courage and comfort and encouragement and guidance and integrity and a commitment to a great cause. In truth, to know the knowledge that God is with us and that we are co-workers with God and that God's love will never fail us. Well, there's strength in that. There's strength in that. That's the power of Pentecost. It fuels and it energizes and it mobilizes and it empowers us to do great things. Knowing that we are absolutely convinced, being absolutely convinced that God is with us and God is for us and God will ultimately win. Well, friends, there's a lot of strength and power in that. The third symbol of the Holy Spirit is the descending dove. And the early Christians who created this symbol were wise to have it descending because that's where the peace of God comes from. And that's what the descending dove speaks to us about. It speaks to us about peace, inner peace, the poise, the serenity, the calmness and courage to face life with all of its troubles in the eyes. Well, that sort of ability comes only from God's presence being in our hearts. One day a teacher was, Miss Thompson was asking her fourth grade class who they thought was the greatest person living today. And the answers were varied and interesting. One person said that they thought it was Peyton Manning because he was an amazing quarterback. Someone else mentioned the president, someone else mentioned Oprah. And on it went with the students listening to various celebrities. Finally, Donnie's turn came. And Donnie, with that hesitation, said, I believe it's Jesus Christ because he loves everybody and he wants to help you. And Miss Thompson smiled and she said, well, Donnie, I like your answer because I'm a Christian too and I admire Jesus, but there's a slight problem. I said, someone who's currently living. We know Jesus lived and died 2,000 years ago. Do you have some other name in mind? Donnie wasn't done. He said, no, Miss Thompson, that's not right. 
Jesus is alive. He lives inside of me. And that's the good news of our faith in the message of Pentecost. That God is with us, working from the inside out, giving us the breath of life, the firepower of commitment, and that peace 